So let's talk today about a couple of things. And I think um, uh, the homework itself was probably easiest, but let's just kind of formalize this of significant figures. Now, actually, if you turn in your, in your packet, actually, no, let's, let's back up a step, sorry. Let's just turn in your packet to page one. We're going to just kind of walk ourselves through this, and we didn't start uh, the podcast that we have on, 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 the, on the server um, are, are, are different than that. So let's just kind of walk ourselves through. So let's just talk about uh, matter real fast. So um, what, what do you know about matter? It takes up space. Good. So it takes up space. And two things. It has mass. So it has mass and it takes up space. That's the definition of matter. Very simple. Okay? And so, um, but matter, if you look at that cool chart that we have on that table there, um, there's two kinds of matter. Right? And you already got the chart there, but you can see there. There's homogeneous mixtures and there's heterogeneous mixtures. All right. And chemistry land, we talk about primarily homogeneous mixtures because that can be break in, broken into what we call pure substances. And when you talk about pure substances, there's two varieties of pure substances. There are compounds and there are elements. What's a compound? Actually, what's an element? Let's do an element first. So on your paper, you're going to make some notes here about elements here. What's an element? Rusty, what's an element? It's one of those things. All right, you find them on the periodic table, don't you? There's uh, roughly 100 of them, 100 and some change, right? Right? So we have... If you look at the periodic table, there's 114 or whatever elements on the periodic table. Um, but what's actually kind of like the definition of an element? Go ahead. Yes, yeah, simplest form of matter. That's a little bit... Why is that a little bit weird? Because we know that elements consist of when uh, elements and atoms are really the same thing. But if you break an atom down, you find protons, neutrons, and electrons. And guess what? You can play, break down protons and neutrons into quarks and leptons and all kinds of weird things. So it, it, it's some level. It is definitely the simplest form of matter. Um, but it's kind of, a, it's kind of the basic piece of matter. All right? Now, if we look at a compound, what's up with a compound? How is that different than an element? Yeah, Mr. Lay. Isn't it something made up of this, like, um, uh, like a carbonate that's a compound because it contains carbon and oxygen? Actually, that's a polyatomic ion, but it, and then it's found in an ion, or it's found in a compound. Good thought. Think of a, com like a molecule. Can somebody think of a molecule, a particular molecule? Molecule that would contain molecules have uh, nonmetals bonded in nonmetals. So a simple carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is a compound that contains carbon and oxygen. In fact, the Lewis structure, if you recall from last year, looks like that. That is one contiguous compound. And so in a molecular structure, it actually looks like that linear uh, triatomic, and it's, that's, that is a compound. Those are, there's a chemical bond between the carbon and the oxygen, and that makes it a compound. Other examples of compounds? Huh? Water, yeah, H2O. Water looks like Mickey Mouse head, right? The O and then the two H's are the years. Okay. Any other compounds? Think of an ionic compound for me. Sodium chloride, yeah, NaCl. That's a compound. An actually interesting thing, if you recall, with ionic compounds is that instead of, if I go back here to um, the carbon dioxide or whatever, this is actually the carbon dioxide right here. 
it's one small piece which got one carbon and two oxygens. How is that different than, say, sodium chloride? Is it one Na connected to one Cl? It's a ratio, that's right. So the Na is connected to the Cl, connected to the Na, connected to the Cl, connected to the Cl, connected to the Na. Actually, we call it a lattice structure. And they go on and on and on. There's sort of this never-ending pattern, pattern um, and it's three-dimensional. So if you look at a crystal of salt, right, you get the idea here. I'm trying to draw it in three dimensions, possibly poorly, but you get the idea. So you have this three-dimensional array. So if you have a small piece of salt and you're looking at a small piece of salt, you'll see it's actually a cube. If you look at a, have you ever looked at a, a, a piece of salt? It looks like a cube. And it is NaCl, NaCl, NaCl. And actually, if you kind of do the math here, each Na is surrounded by how many Cls do you think? Can you think about it spatially here? Four is not correct. Three-dimensionally. Six is correct. And each chlorine is surrounded by six sodiums. All right, if you kind of look at that, right? Because you've got one, two, three, four, and then there's the one kind of coming out of the board at you, and then the one going up, if you kind of look at that Na. You see that? So, so, but the pattern, we say NaCl, but it's like Na 10 billion, Cl 10 billion, but the ratio is one to one. If you have calcium chloride, for example, CaCl2, it's also a pattern, although it's not going to be a nice pretty cube. It's actually quite a bit more complex in its structural formula, but it's still just a one to two ratio. So Ca a billion, uh, uh, Cl 2 billion is the ratio, ionic. And how, what, how can you distinguish an ionic from a covalent? Yes, Beth Ann, that's correct. This, of course, is a metal bonded to a non-metal, right? And then back here with our molecular compound, or our covalent compound, that's a non-metal bonded to a non-metal. Now, just a good review. How do you know if something's a metal versus a non-metal? Charge, sort of. Where it is on the periodic table, right? On the periodic table, there's the stair-step line, right? Where are your metals? These are the metals, and these are the non-metals. There's one exception, hydrogen. Hydrogen is a non-metal, even though he's over there. Everybody else got it? So that's how you can know. So if I have an ionic compound versus a molecular or a covalent compound, same ballgame. Okay? So this is kind of bringing back some memories here. You're going, oh, oh yeah, mm-hmm. But it's been, what, three months or two and a half months since you probably thought chemistry uh, stuff, so... So we've got compounds, and of course, compound elements are made of atoms. We already can, you can see that on the table. And of course, the atom has a nucleus and it has electrons. And while we're at this, let's just talk about the atom. You should be writing these kind of in, in the sort of white space around there. If you take an atom, atoms are really, really what? Small. And if you recall the analogy, we'll use this analogy. I think we had this last year, but we're going to go ahead and say it. If I have um, the world. Okay, I have to do attendance. Okay, thank you. Um, if I have the world, no, no, I do this right. This is not a world. This is an orange. I'm jumping ahead. How many atoms in an orange? A lot. To do that, you would have to to blow up the orange to the size of the world, and the atoms would be the size of cherries. So imagine the world filled with cherries. Okay? Tiny cherries. Well, not tiny, but ch ch cherries. And then you stuff that many cherries into the world. That's the same number of atoms that are stuffed into an orange. That's a lot. It's a huge number, isn't it? Okay? And then the crazy thing about this, of course, is that if I were to look inside of that cherry... And I blew the cherry, which is in the world, up to the size of the earth. Not the earth. I blew up the size of this room. The nucleus would sit in the center, wouldn't it? And it would be the size of... So if we think of a ball the size of this room. It was the diameter of this room. How big would the nucleus be? The answer is it would be invisible. It would be too small to see in this room. For us to truly see this, we'd have to blow it up to the size of a the ball the size of a, a football field. So if I talk about the nucleus now, now this is the cherry in the earth, which is really, 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 really small. 
if this is now a, a ball the size of a football stadium, so you can go outside and make a ball the size of our football stadium. Actually, it needs to be a bigger football stadium than that, but double, you know, like a, a regular football stadium, as in like a, a, a NFL, like a mile-high stadium or something like that. Then the nucleus is now the size of a marble, or maybe a cherry or whatever. And what's in between here and out here? Well, actually, what is out here? Electrons, and the electrons are like pieces of dust. So what's in an atom, mainly? Empty space. Nothing. It's empty. It's weird. When Ernest Rutherford figured this out in 1914 or whatever it was, he, uh, he said, it was as if I shot a cannonball at a piece of tissue paper and the cannonball came back and hit me in the face. This doesn't make any sense. But it is the way it is. So we have a whole unit on the atom or chapter 7. It's kind of towards the end of the year. Even though it's chapter 7, we jump around a little bit. Um, but it's crazy. Crazy small. Uh, so, atoms. Good? All right. Say again. That doesn't look like a football stadium? Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was one thing out of the money last year in fantasy football. I lost because of a snowstorm. And my team... I had this great passer, the guy from Cleveland, and um, they had a snowstorm and they handed the ball off the whole game. They never handed the ball game, a whole game, so I lost. It was, it was bad. Oh, well. Anyways, lost my train of thought here. Oh, next page. Let's go to page two. Uh, mixtures. There's homogeneous and heterogeneous. Let's just quickly talk ourselves through this. What's the definition of a homogeneous mixture? Uh, homogeneous, of course, means the same. So it is, uh, it is a consistent mixture. So you have a consistent consistency, uh, if you will. What's an example of a homogeneous mixture? So, so, so in, in a homogeneous mixture, every every um, sip, if it was a aqueous solution, um, would be the same. Okay. A soda would be a good example, yeah. Other homogeneous mixtures? Water. Water is a compound, so no, that would not be true. Good thought. So it has to be a mixture. And a mixture is where you take two or more compounds and or elements and mix them together. So a soda is a mixture of water, and then dissolved in the water is sugar, carbon dioxide, flavors, etc. And then hopefully every sip of your Mountain Dew or, or your Pepsi or whatever is going to be the same. It has like little floaties and stuff in it, then it's not homogeneous. Any, any other homogeneous mixtures? Milk, yeah, huh? Other examples? Think of non liquid ones. Everybody take a deep breath. Air is correct. Because air consists of 80% nitrogen and 20% oxygen. Actually, the 80% um, nitrogen is actually probably 79%. And then there's actually 1% of other gases, carbon dioxide, argon, etc. And in varyingly small percentages. So usually we just think of it as 80, 20. It's really 79, 20, and then you got this extra bit. So that's some good examples of homogeneous. What about heterogeneous mixtures? So it's, they're, they're not consistent, right? I like to think of them as the lumpy ones. An example of a heterogeneous mixture. Huh? I can't hear you. Rocks, yeah. So if you go, go grab a rock from Pikes Peak, or just from your backyard, which probably came from Pikes Peak, um, but uh, it's got like a bunch of little crystals. Is is every rock kind of the, the same exact number of crystals? Of course they are. So it's not consistent, is it? All right. One of the big problems in chemistry land or the world is that it is pretty heterogeneous in its um, just kind of out in nature. 